Hi, everyone. My name is Fabio Fernandez. I'm the new director of Greenwich House Pottery, and I want to welcome you all here. It's a fantastic thing to do on a, on a Friday. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to hear artists talk about their work. Um, so we're here at Greenwich House Pottery in Greenwich Village. Pottery was founded in 1909. Many of you already know this. Many of you have deep connections to the place. Um, some of you are maybe new to Greenwich House Pottery, and I just want to tell you a little bit about it. We, as I said, were founded in 1909, and we have three programs. We have our classes and workshops, where we have about 300 students any given semester. Um, we also have a residency program, where we invite artists from all over the country to come and, and the world, actually, to have a space where they can make and they can uh, get materials and space and access to all kinds of technical knowledge. And our third program area is our exhibition. And so this program today um, kind of touches upon both because Kari was a resident here and now we're having an exhibition of some of the work that she made in response to, I'll let Kari tell you about that. Uh, but I invite you to come and visit the pottery if, if you're in New York City and if you're vaccinated. Um, otherwise, I will turn it over to our very capable and intelligent curator and uh, fellowship manager, Caitlin McClure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you to Sequoia and Takari for a great exhibition. I'm really looking forward to this talk. Um, so first, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, please, everyone mute yourselves now and stay muted during the talk. If you have a question during the talk, feel free to chat it into the chat box. I'll be keeping an eye on that. And if there's something that I think needs to be asked immediately, I'll ask it to Kari and Sequoia. Otherwise, we can wait for most of the questions until the end of the presentation. And then you should feel free to unmute yourself to ask the question or you know, you can still chat it and I'll ask it out loud for you. Um, but so now we just have some quick introductions before we roll right into the talk. So Kari Marvo is a Bay Area artist and an assistant professor at California College of the Arts. Her work engages communities with each other and with the past by delving into archives and presenting response works in ceramics, photography, and silkscreen play. Her research-based ceramic works have been presented at Mills College Art Museum, the Museum of Craft and Design, and Wave Pool Gallery. Sequoia Miller is a historian, curator, and studio potter. He holds a PhD in the history of art from Yale University and an MA from the Bard Graduate Center for Decorative Arts, Design, History, and Material Culture. He re-entered academia after more than a decade as a full-time studio potter. His recent curatorial projects include Raw and Ai Weiwei and Broken at the Gardner Museum in Toronto, Canada, where he's currently the chief curator and deputy director. And both Kari and Sequoia are well known to the GHP community. As Fabio mentioned, Kari was a fellow with us uh, during the summer of 2019, and she did a lot of archival research. And Sequoia was, um, so he uh, studied with uh, Michael Simon, Bruce Wynn, and Matt Nolan here at GHP, and then also became an instructor, uh, I think that was in 2011 and 2012. So um, Kari and Sequoia are definitely uh, good parts of our communities. Um, but so without any further ado, Kari and Sequoia, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to you. Elon, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and it's just been such a pleasure to work with you and Fabio and everybody at Greenwich House Pottery. You always pick up the phone, which is really nice, um, <laughs> your phone people. Um, so we've, yeah, it's just, it's been a delight. And I'm sorry that we can't be there all together in person, um, but hopefully at another time. Um, I wanted to um, also thank my parents, Bonnie and Chuck, who are here, and my sister, Eleanor, who helped get things out the door and shipped, and um, everybody just pulled a lot of weight during the pandemic time. So thank you to my family. Um, and also thank you to Sequoia, obviously, <laughs> for all of your wonderful words um, surrounding the show and for uh, personally picking up some elements of the show. Um, I am going to share my screen, if that's okay with everyone, so that we can see a few slides. Okay. 
looks good. <laughs> um, I was first introduced to Mene Nagoro's work when I did a fellowship at Greenwich House Pottery, which Caitlin mentioned. Um, and I was focusing at that time on an artist named um, Daniel Rhodes, who is also an author and taught at Alfred um, for 25 years. And during my time there, Caitlin was finding all these archival items um, for Daniel Rhodes, and we came across Nagoro's work because she was connected with him uh, to him um, because she was put into a Japanese internment camp, and he happened to be teaching ceramics at that internment camp. And um, she had been um, attempting to complete um, an undergrad degree at UCLA and uh, was put in the camp, and she had been doing art previously and then started doing ceramics because of Rhodes. Um, and then she went on to study at Alfred and then also um, began the ceramics program at the Uni University of Connecticut. So I took an interest in her work and, um, and while well, Sequ Sequoia is the writer <laughs> and I'm kind of the maker and I mean, I am the maker and I also view myself as um, a student of Nagoro's at this point. Obviously we couldn't meet, but I've been learning about her and about ceramics through studying her works and looking at catalogs of her um, of her pieces and uh, reading quotes from her and just trying to get to know her and um, as a, a fellow educator also get some teaching strategies from her as well. The so here's um, an image of what the exhibition looks like. And there are a few main parts. There are some archival items. Um, and then I made response works in three sections. Here's a mold of one of uh, Menina Gros pieces. The first response that I made was to her um, ashtrays, which you see here on the left. And I found her ashtrays to be um, of an unexpected design. I wouldn't necessarily peg them as ashtrays at first. And I was curious about them. Um, the closest one here of mine is based on a design that she created, um, which I also found online for um, just under $2,000, <laughs> a set of these. Um, so she is still around in some ways. And um, so that was the first one that I had sort of seen and I made a response work, the one at the bottom. And then the other two, I was really fascinated by the way that she had in her ashtrays confined the glaze to a specific section of the piece pieces. And then also how the clay body really shows up in the works. and. She was primarily um, creating functional pieces. I work in ceramic sculpture. So when I made response works to her, I wanted to think about how to confine the glaze, how to show the clay body. But then because I'm sculpture, I wanted to upend the, um, the ashtray a little bit and make it um, into a sculpture versus a functional piece, um, literally by just turning, the, um, turning it upwards. And then the next pieces. This, my piece is on the left hand side, and this is a mini Nagora work that's on the right hand side. It's a it's called Jug with Lid, and it was at the Mills College Art Museum where I did an exhibition about Daniel Rhodes in 2020 that Caitlin had um, visited, which was amazing. <laughs> It was right before the pandemic really hit, um, which means technically that show is the longest running show at the Mills College Art Museum because we couldn't get anything out of the galleries. So it, we did it. <laughs> the jug with lid, what I found fascinating about it was that it was um, this really, it's a, it's very, it's a little bit playful. It's very sincere in being a tight container and then it has this very very funky glaze on the top that's textured and it to me it looked like she had put it's unusual she, she may have put sand or grog or something went into that to make it gritty 
Um, and so when I made my response piece to that work, I was thinking more about, again, how do I take this functional item and make it more sculptural? And additionally, what would maybe be the chaos that would be contained within this vessel? So I, I view this vessel as the inside of what was um, what what is uh, to the right of it, and um, and I put sand into a satin mat um, black glaze. I I literally um, just you know just piled it into the glaze and mixed it around, and it worked out really nicely um, for that to get that texture. And here additionally, there this is a catalog from 1992 um, when Minnie Nagoro had a retrospective at the University of Connecticut where she started the ceramics program and taught. And here you can see, this is a little bit of what the texture looks like. Um, she had a very wide range of structures and glazes that she used. This white one was actually one that was um, shown at Greenwich House Pottery that Caitlin had found some slides of later. So you can see her range is just um, incredible and I really appreciate her. Um, and you can see the, oh, there's a little bit of, a, here's a closer shot um, of that texture coming out. And here you can see her texture on the top of this. And then lastly, um, we also, Caitlin had found a plate of Mini Nagoros, this um, white plate on the end. And I was thinking about her and, um, and looking at her quotes from this wonderful catalog from 1992. And what I wanted to do was um, interact with her. And so I made some plates. <laughs> Some sculptural plates um, and put palladium on top of that, on top of them, and tried to think a bit about her, her life and her personality, and add some movement um, and energy to the plate. And yeah, so that is what I have to share with you. And thank you again, Caitlin, and um, everyone at Greenwich House for picking out these um, wonderful shots of the work. Because again, we can't be there, but. I think they really, they really um, are wonderful representations of what is happening in the in the gallery right now. And I'll leave it to Sequoia. Okay, thank you, Kari. Um, hello, greetings, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning, wherever you are. I hope um, everyone is well and um, delighted to be here to be able to speak a bit about this project and about some of um, our thinking and our questions around this uh, figure of uh, Mini Nagoro. So Kari, if I could ask you to go back to the mold uh, slide, please, that might be a good place to start. Um, so I think it would be good maybe to begin by speaking about sort of how, how I came to be thinking about this particular person and sort of how we got to kind of where we are uh, together for this project. So what we're looking at here is a plaster mold. It's a two-part mold and it's what um, people use to make slipcast ceramics. Um, this is a kind of ceramics that's usually associated with production, either batch production or kind of a mid-level production, meaning you have like a line of ceramics typically that you're selling. Of course, sculptors use it now for sure to make one-off items. But um, at the time that this was made, which would have been in the early 1950s, it was um, really associated with that uh, the idea of the artist craftsman or kind of the link between industry and handmade studio craft. So for me, um, I came across Mini Nagoro uh, through, through the idea of absence. This was about 10 or 12 years ago when I was a student at the Bard Graduate Center and I was actually researching the Good Design uh, exhibition series, which was held at the Museum of Modern Art for about five years from 1950 to 1955. And the Good Design exhibitions were um, really a way for MoMA as kind of the taste maker to set up a sort of set of criteria for what um, really, I mean, they were pretty uh, bold about it, good design versus bad design. And um, I, was, uh, I was curious about this whole project and these like, ideas. And I was flipping through a good design catalog and I saw um, Mini Nagoro Ceramics, I was kind of curious and also came across a bunch of other folks whose names um, I hadn't you know, been familiar with and was sort of wondering generally about this idea of who we know about and who we don't know about and 
why and under what circumstances. As I continued to look through the archive at MoMA, I came across a letter from the curator, the administrator of the exhibition, to Mini Nagoro saying, thank you so much for participating in the Good Design exhibition. We've actually lost your work and your ashtray will not be returned to you. We appreciate your participation. And that was it. That was like the end of the letter. And it struck me as so um, kind of shocking in a way that that it would it, it would be so offhand that like you participated in this and we're not going to return your work to you because we lost it. Um, and it seemed to have a kind of cavalier uh, sense to it. And for me, it resonated with this idea of absence, the idea of not having heard of this mini Nagoro person and who she was or kind of what she was about seemed to in some way um, reverberate with the idea of her, of her artwork being, being lost and unaccounted for. So for me, this, um, this mold is actually really phenomenal because it, it speaks to the absence of her work in the archive, in the broad, kind of the archive writ large, the broad sense. Um, I then started to, to kind of research her to look into Mini Nagoro. If you Google her name, one of the first things you find is this um, image of her. And Kari, maybe if you could go ahead to a couple of slides to the image of her with Daniel Rhodes. <coughs> yeah, here. So um, if you Google Mini Nagoro, these are kind of the first images that, that come up and in particular, the one on the left. And these were both images um, from early 1943 that again, were taken at the Hart Mountain Relocation Center as it was called, um, which was a detainment, detention center for uh, Japanese Americans in, uh, during World War II. Um, Hart Mountain is in Wyoming. And as Kari mentioned, Minnie Nagoro was born and raised in um, Los Angeles. She was, you know, an American, an art student. She was in her final semester of, uh, of school at the UCLA um, when her family was ordered to, to leave California. The guy that she's standing with is, if you're in the kind of ceramics world, there's a good chance that Daniel Rhodes is a familiar name to you. He's a very, very well-known figure for a couple of reasons. One is for his artwork, for sure. He was a kind of a potter and sculptor, active from the 40s into, I actually don't have his life dates, but into the probably the 1990s, I'm guessing. Um, he also is well known because he wrote uh, this book, Clay and Glazes for the Potter, which for years became like a kind of standard textbook for a number of undergraduate uh, courses. So there's this picture here, <coughs> they sort of love and hate, and it shows Minnie Nagoro as the kind of disciplined student, and Daniel Rhodes is sort of the, the sage who, you know, the, has the pipe in his mouth and is sort of pointing out some kind of feature of Minnie's work that she can uh, learn from or draw her attention to. Um, and again, this, this photo is from uh, Heart Mountain. And in, as I started to read up on this, one other um, aspect of this scene really stood out to me. Thanks for the dates there. So to 1989 for Daniel Rhodes. Um, one, one other factor stood out to me, which is that, in, and Daniel Rhodes wrote about this. He went to Heart Mountain um, as, a, as an army um, uh, conscript, basically. He was in the Army Corps of Engineers and he had some ceramic training, <coughs> excuse me. And he was actually sent to Heart Mountain to set up a, a pottery making factory. The idea was, and it's a little bit shocking now, I think, but the idea was that the folks in the detention center, because they were Japanese or Japanese American, kind of had a natural affinity for ceramics and that they could in fact be, like establish a ceramic making factory where they would make dishes for the army. The idea was that they would, you know, in this detention center, they would establish a production facility that would supply the US military with its tableware, which to me is kind of mind boggling. Um, so this didn't get anywhere, it didn't get off the ground, but Daniel Rhodes got there. He, you know, built a few wheels and Minnie Nagoro learned how to throw. Apparently they prospected for clay. So clay was kind of dug rather than being delivered. They never got a kiln set up though. So um, Minnie and the others would throw pottery and then squish up the forms and make them again, sort of learn how, learn how to throw but not actually complete any objects. So um, as, as Kari mentioned, Minnie then uh, was a student at Alfred University. Uh, she finished in her MFA. She received in 1950. She relocated to uh, to New England, where she set up Nagoro Ceramics. And this um, 
1950 was again when she was in the Good Design exhibition. So her participation uh, in an exhibition at MoMA, like her first year out of her MFA program, she had designed a line of ceramics to sell. It was seems like it would kind of be a big step, right? Like making a splash, you have a very sort of um, visible presence, I think, as she emerged into the world. I, I'll point out one other kind of research anecdote, I guess, that I came across early on was um, was that Minnie was also very, I guess this is two actually, Minnie was very active at Greenwich House. So in the same way that Kari and I both have this kind of long or longish uh, association with Greenwich House, Minnie Nagoro has been exhibiting at Greenwich House for the, for the last 50 or 60 years. So there's something about the stickiness of the place that I find um, interesting and appealing. I also came across some very kind of oblique references to um, Maybe we could switch images again, Kari, maybe to the ashtrays, I think. Um, early on in researching Minnie's work, um, I also came across references to an exhibition that she was in in the 1960s, in the early 1960s in New York at a place called the Nonagon Gallery. And her co-exhibitors, brace yourselves, were Yoko Ono and Charlie Mingus. So the idea that like this kind of potter who was, you know, making relatively traditional forms, either in a kind of Minge pottery mode or in a kind of good design mode, like the ashtrays we're seeing here, would actually have been part of an avant-garde, right? That included performance, uh, improvised jazz, um, is, is stunning, I think, and is a way that we are starting as a community to understand the complexity of pottery and the complexity of ceramics and the way that it functions within a broader set of ideas and set of questions. And it's not about exclusively tradition or kind of maintaining some kind of, um, I wish, maybe I could say craft, uh, but it's also about um, this bigger conversation. And so for me, these, these questions and these stories are embedded initially in the absence of the objects uh, from the archive, and now in the recovery of the objects from the archive. So the fact that Caitlin was able to find these ashtrays at Greenwich House, that Kari and I were able to find the molds, which have been, you know, lovingly kept by Denise Pelletier in, in Rhode Island for, for these years, a student of Minnie Nagoro's, um, that Minnie has, uh, as I have, as I'm understanding it now, is has used her absence strategically. And so what I would propose maybe is the idea of absence as a, um, as a proactive position, absence as a, as a stance of action and a stance of agency rather than um, simply a passive, something that happens to you. Absence isn't only about erasure, but it's also about a, um, a decision to, to step back. And maybe now I'll kind of turn it over to Carrie to, to ask you, Kari, um, <coughs> excuse me, Kari, for some of your, your thoughts about absence and presence. And in a way, we're, I mean, we're encountering absence now because we're not in New York and we're not all together in the same room. And if we could go to your, your ashtrays, perhaps, to think about, um, to think about absence in, in your work. And you've spoken about kind of the containment of, of glaze and the kind of upending of the idea of an ashtray. I'm wondering look, if we look at your ashtrays, if we can think about what, you know, kind of what absence, um, how do we visualize absence maybe? Yeah, thank you, Sequoia. It's a great question. I, um, I think <laughs> with Minnie Nagora, there were, um, Obviously, we found some of her items and some archival items, and then you um, picked up the mold. So she is present, but I, what I was, um, as I was trying to look into her, what I hit against most of the time was a, a lack of representation, a lack of knowing her work. Um, and it wasn't really until I got my hands on um, this, uh, the catalog that I showed in the slides where I heard her voice for the first time. Um, and I think because I had done the project on Daniel Rhodes, who does nothing but talk extensively, <laughs> 
just through so many books, through Clayglis, through the Potter, their interviews of him. I went to Alfred and they have um, 20 boxes of his of his archive. There was like just so much information and so much of his language um, and videos and everything. So I felt like he, I had a hard time actually just thinking my own thoughts when I was working on that project. But with Minnie, it was the opposite. And um, so I was happy to get my hands on this catalog, which came from some obscure live, oh, not obscure. It came from the, um, it was like from the University of Arizona in Tucson. You can see that they um, decided to give it to some thrift store and then I got it from them on the internet. And her words were really important to me. Um, in the back of the catalog, and this is a little bit unusual, she not only, um, she has some notes where she says, my career began in 1942 at Heart Mountain, Wyoming with Daniel Rhodes. He introduced me to the joy and tranquility of throwing. Um, and then she talks a little bit about her career and then she goes into this very funky section where she talks, where she speaks to the clay bodies, but from her own voice. So she'll, she'll say things like, with the earthen, earthenware, the red art clay I mined in Ohio, and it's used without additions and fire to cone three. Um, <laughs> at this temperature, the clay has a rich red color, which is also probably the color potentially that we're seeing on the mold like the residue that's on the mold that, um, image that you showed, because you can never get rid of red clay. It's a disaster. <laughs> so I think to me, I was feeling a lot of absence um, from her without, because I was searching for her and I was trying to find her. And then there were a few elements that I that I picked up and I really heard her voice and it was very clear. And you had mentioned this idea that she um, made an active decision to have silence. And it wasn't because she wasn't well-spoken or didn't convey her ideas well, because we can see that clearly in this catalog alone. It was that she let the work speak for her and her career speak for her. She was just, she had a different mode, a very different mode than say Daniel Rhodes, who was she she was actively had actively learned from. Um, so I think with um, I think with my pieces, I had mentioned the idea of having them be more sculptural than functional. So I started with the functional in the forefront here, and then I then I upended them and had them. I was thinking about them more as just kind of reflections of her um, and pieces that wouldn't necessarily contain the ashes, but represent um, more of the feelings behind the works. I'd love to pick I up- I can be very bold and ask a technical question. Um, tell me tell me not if uh, this isn't helpful at this moment, but um, while we're looking at this, these ashtrays, um, it, it's really striking to me how um, the different clay bodies that you used on the ashtrays, Kari. And I was wondering if if this was the right moment to talk about it. Maybe it's not, but um, the different level of, levels of grog in each of the clay bodies, and then the different colors as well. Yeah, it's a great question. I did I did fire them to three just because. I mean, it was in the catalog. Um, the the one at the um, Let's see, the one at the forefront is, Caitlin did this amazing thing where <laughs> one day in the mail, I got a, um, a box of clay that was from Greenwich House. And presumably it was the same clay body that, that Nina Goro had used um, in her own practice. And I love working with site specific materials and I wasn't quite sure how to do that for this project. Um, but then this box came and it was very heavy. And I, I think the male person was like, who are these people? <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> um, so the one, the piece in the forefront is um, is that clay body. And it's very smooth because it's throwing clay. So there's no grog or sand in it. Um, and then I, I also, because she had been, sh she shows so much of the clay body, I wanted to play with having variations in the clay body 
for for those to come come out and see what they would do with the glazes as well. Um, and so the piece um, that the tallest one that is brown is Black Mountain clay that has both sand and grog in it. And then the one all the way to the left is um, is a speckled buff clay body, which has just a little bit of grog in it. So they, they all have um, variations. And you can see that actually with the way that the glazes sit on the pieces. Um, the, the darker back brown one obviously is the most gritty and you can see that coming through. So anyway, does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, I highly recommend um, Black Mountain Clay. It's, it's great and it really stands up. You can do magic with it. I would love to pick up on the um, on the the comment you made, Kari, about the red never coming out of a mold. Um, and so this is like an iron rich clay that will tend to like stain plaster, which is typically white. And for me, this connects to the idea of archive, which is so much a part of this project and thinking about like, where do we leave traces? Where are we absent? And then how are we as students, let's say, or researchers even, like how do we train ourselves to find these traces or not? And in some sense, the red that has stained, the red from the iron and the clay that has stained this mold, like that's the trace that Mini Nagoro is leaving. Like that's part of the archive. That's one of the threads that Kari and I are kind of trying to pick up and make sense out of and to learn from and to become sort of uh, students in a way of, of Mini Nagoro's. And in a sense, I the the phrase that I propose for this in the in the exhibition is the idea that it's a haptic archive. It's like a physical set of things, like a stained mold that can be the mechanism, that can be the evidence, maybe, from which we come to understand understand this the strategic use of absence and of silence, which I I think. Um, for me, and maybe we can go to that lovely image of the two jars in front of the window. For me, the notion of silence comes very much out of absence, right? I feel like silence and absence are connected to each other <clears throat> completely, but they're also distinct from each other. And I think in the case of Mini Nagoro, the silence had to do with, um, with her, like her voice, as you say, Kari, like her voice comes through in that catalog because there is this statement of it. But Minnie, like Minnie Nagora was not afraid to speak, certainly. And she was a teacher for decades, right? She was a communicator. She was a conveyor of information. But she, my, my maybe our sort of theory or philosophy is that she was very deliberate and strategic in how, in how and when she used her voice and in what she said and in why she said what she said. So whereas someone like Daniel Rhodes was trained to, you know, talk all the time and to write as much as he could, Minnie Nagara took a very different approach, but one that was no less potent in terms of the information that she had to communicate. Um, I think this use of silence is also pertinent to the idea of internment. And of course, I can never understand what it means to be interned or to have been interned. From my understanding, Mini Nagoro made a deliberate choice not to speak about her internment until the very end of her life. It was really when she was quite a bit older that she decided to uh, participate in oral history projects and to give some um, interviews where she did speak um, very openly about her experiences in the detention camp. And I feel like that, again, is a, is a very deliberate kind of strategic use in her from her of, um, of silence and, and speech and voice and expression. I think maybe the, the other piece of silence that for me comes up looking at these two works in particular, <clears throat> um, sorry if this is a reach, but it's the idea of silence and the void, silence and its connection to the void, sort of the absence of speech and the absence of a thing, right? And so, and when we look at the jar, at both of the jars really, when we look at these jars, so much of the form is premised on the absence of a center, right? This is the definition of a vessel, is that it's a container, and that there is in fact a way of understanding the vessel as, as the void at the center, that the pot is not the, the clay jar that we're looking at, but the pot is the void in the middle, and the clay 
is sort of describing the boundary, basically, of the of the vessel or of the void or of the silence, right? So for me, when I'm looking at um, at Minnie's jar, I'm thinking about the center of it and the void that's at the center and the way that Minnie's jar is so silent, it's so like contained, it's so sort of concentrated and so kind of honed in on that core, that unknowable really void or core of, of silence at the center. And Kari's is, has the silence too, but it's sort of exploded in this way. It has like these, <laughs> it has these gaps and it has these moments. So it's sort of like, like silent, present, absent, present, silent, speaking. And it's, I, for me, it's also a little bit like, and that kind of messiness in a way, wonderful, wonderful messiness is a kind of, has a kind of um, that back and forth way of trying to like look at something. It's like, if you look at something, it's almost lenticular, you know, like those um, things that kind of move when you go left or right and the bunny goes up and down or whatever. It's a little bit lenticular. It's like, Kari's kind of going inside the jar and outside the jar and inside the jar and outside the jar. So there's this permeability to that center void. And what it results is in this kind of series of lines or of rings that are kind of piled on top of each other, but falling off of each other. Kari, does that make any sense to you? Or do you feel like that's a random way of looking at this jar of yours? No, I'm, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> I think it's also um, when you're learn, I, I, yes, it makes a lot of sense. And I think we're learning on two different levels as well. Like one is I was learning from her as artist um, and, you know, what, what are the tech, what is she doing? What are the techniques? But my work is never going to be like hers. My response work is always going to be like mine. And it almost feels like this is how we would look if we were standing at a party together. Like I would look like kind of messy and like, you know, just, I don't know, in loops and she would be contained um, and thoughtful. So it's, I, I think they're, they in a way, they're, yeah, they're portraits and they're in conversation with one another. And I, I like the way that they interact a lot. And I also appreciate the shot, Caitlin, that you got of these two together, because it was very different. Um, it's been different um, when I've had it photographed in other settings. Uh, and then I think also, Sequoia, what is exciting about this project is that you and I were both coming at it well, I mean, obviously you're at the museum and, um, and I'm a, a, I teach at a college. And so we're both looking at it as what is this information? Who is this person? What is the history of this? And then as um, creatives or artists, what are we getting out of it? What are we making from it? Um, and how do we <clears throat> share this information with people <clears throat> and, and continue the education? Because if, if ceramics is a small field and there's this lineage and it's really important to have all of your players um, at the forefront, whether you can speak to them or whether you're reading their words out of a catalog. So I, it's really enjoyable to, to and a, like kind of a, a very big honor to be reside, like have one of my works getting to sit next to one of hers. Yeah, it's like getting to be, it's like getting to be a student of hers in a way. I mean, we've obviously like nominated ourselves and elected ourselves and put ourselves in this position. And that's part of the, you know, well, when you're dead, you don't get to choose like your people who, who adopt you as their teacher. Um, but I think it does speak to the kind of the third kind of thematic of the show, which is legacy, which is the idea of who, like, what are, what are the, the legacies of our, of our work? Um, and how do we, how do we continue to teach and how do we continue to sort of promote learning? Maybe Kari, you could move ahead or before we, before we move ahead, I do want to flag Ashwini brought up the word unraveling in reference to your jar, which I think is really, really great and to think about that unspooling or unraveling is really good. Um, but if you could go ahead to the, um, to the plate images and we can think about sort of what it means to adopt someone as a teacher and what it means to kind of consciously pick someone up and, and, and try to learn from them. And I think one thing that is, that I really got very clearly from my conversations with Denise, who um, Denise Pelletier again was one of many students and has been um, an artist very active in the field for some time and amazing. And it's, and I really understood from Denise, I think Minnie's commitment to teaching and the importance and centrality of, of teaching in, in her life. 
And I feel like that, in a way, um, maybe this is an excuse on my own, but it makes it feel okay, in a sense, for us to decide to be her students and to decide to continue learning from from her and from her work. Because I feel like I feel like there's something um, something open about being a teacher, right? Where you're inevitably okay with people coming into your set of practices or ideas or what you have to offer and like you're a teacher now Kari you're like so every like you don't get to choose who's in your class right like people show up first day of class people show up and in a way like this show is like the first day of class and like we're showing up to many to many Nagara's class and um and it does feel like an honor in a way and I and I feel like it's also important for us I mean so there's legacy in the sense of like she we can we as a community and we as individuals can still learn from her there's also legacy in the sense of honoring someone's legacy and wanting to kind of do right by her and i think one of the parts of this project that's um that's important for me is the idea that this is we're absolutely i feel like i'm absolutely trying to kind of center mini nagoro's work and her approach to the world and her, again, her kind of active strategies for being an artist and being a teacher um, as a way to, to honor her legacy um, and to help bring that legacy to a broader kind of world. Um, if you could go to the, to the image of the desk, I think that would be great to, to talk about for a couple minutes. So again, for, you know, you can see from these installation images, it would be in the other direction, actually. I think that there's a close up at the end, yeah. Um, so looking at some of these installation images and other images, you can see it's a relatively small um, exhibition project, but there's a combination of both um, artworks by Mini Nagoro and actually one more slide, I think there's a close up. There's um, a combination of objects made by Mini Nagoro, like her ashtray, her jar, this um, bowl here, which in fact is a glaze test from Alfred. So artworks made by Mini Nagoro, artworks made by uh, Kari, and then uh, kind of writing from me, and these archival objects, right? The sort of haptic archive, the, the molds, some photographs, the catalogs. And what we're looking at here is this fantastic desk that I'll speak to in a second, but we're looking at three objects from um, Mini Nagoro's uh, archive. So as I've mentioned, there's the pot, and that is a small bowl. It has a, a kind of an iron saturate glaze. This was from among a series of glaze tests that she made in 1950 at Alfred. I would propose that she was working out the ceramic line that she would then um, uh, uh, try to uh, promote and make a living from that was in, again, the Good Design exhibitions. So we have the glaze test. We have the tool, which is the wooden object that's lying on the desk there. And that's a um, like a wooden pottery tool. If you've worked in a clay studio, it will be familiar to you as sort of a general type of like a wooden tool for forming clay or smoothing out clay. It's hard to see, but um, it says M. Nagoro on it in, in small letters. And it looks very clearly to me that she made this, um, that she made this for herself to make her to make her own work. The notebook that's standing up on the table is a um, small notebook, about five by seven or so. And you can see we've kind of cropped it open at the, the sort of little black speckles at the bottom of, near the bottom of the page, say Mini Nagoro. Um, there. The book has a cloth cover. It's very um, sort of beautifully made, um, but there's nothing else in it. It's, it only has her name on the first page and the rest of it is blank, which to me is insanely poetic and speaks again to these <laughs> questions of silence and absence and the sort of deliberate presence within a kind of, within silence. And um, that's, that's what I see and think about when I look at this journal. So I feel like the three of these objects, again, come together on this theme or this idea or this question of legacy and how we can, how we as students or as artists or as humans can continue to learn from those that, that came before us. And maybe a final comment on this is the desk itself, which is one of the original desks from Greenwich House, again, founded in, was it 1909, as a workspace, as a place to learn and to, um, come to know how to make things. And I love, love, love that this desk is still, like it was there. You know, I didn't like search for years to find an original Greenwich House pottery desk. Like it was in the space. And this is the legacy also. This is the legacy of like 
sitting down on a chair at a desk and like learning your stuff, like figure, which means to me, like who you are and why you're on this planet and what you want to make. So, so maybe I'll ask Kari a question. Like Kari, if you were going to sit down at this chair and make something from Mindy Nagora, what do you think you'd make at this point? Oh, well, first I'd make more leg room because I'm tall. So I don't know if this desk would contain me. Um, but I love, I love that there's a little drawer. What do you do? You keep your tools in there. What happens? Um, I mean, if I had, if I was able to sit at this desk right now, I would, I don't know, I would be tempted to bring my own notebook and fill it with ideas of this experience of creating the show and make some language for, I would not fill her book, but I would maybe fill my own sketchbook with ideas around the show and, and all that I've learned and all that I also want to keep with me too. I'd want it to contain the things that I've been able to pick up. Um, like, yeah, like a very self-directed workshop in somebody else's practice um, with good friends. Um, you know, obviously Sequoia, we've gotten to know one another during the pandemic, which is always weird to pick up a friend during a pandemic, <laughs> uh, unprecedented. And then being connected to the pottery, I think, yeah, I would not, I would never change this desk setup uh, for the world, and I can't believe it was on hand. Although I kind of can, because that place squirrels away items, I've noticed. <laughs> and they're like, a lot of them are like at ceiling level too. You can't, you never know what's going on there. Um, I will say that her use of, um, just on a personal note, her use of the, the grittiness and the black glazes, and in this test too, we see it again. I think that darkness speaks to all all of the themes like absence and silence and legacy and it's it's something that i definitely will continue um to work on and similarly as as an artist and educator working in the field of ceramics now i it this project very much has gotten me thinking about what am i archiving of my own practice how am i preserving myself um uh, what kind of notes would I want to leave behind? Um, what do I want to make sure that I impart to my students in the present, um, especially now that we're in, in person a little bit again? So yeah, she, she's she been a, a, a good teacher and I'm sad to have not met her, but I am very grateful for the things that she's left behind. That was kind of a long answer, sorry. <laughs> no, that's great, love it. Um, so maybe why don't we pull out of the PowerPoint and Caitlin, maybe we can open it up for um, more questions at this point or look through the chat, you can plug in. Yeah, there. yeah, let's start by looking through the chat and then um, people can chime in with their other questions as well. So um, the first question um, is, so from Kiani, she's curious to know um, if the Mini Nagoro oral history is available to the public? Is there any way kind of anyone can listen to the oral history she left behind? You know, um, I, we can't, not, I, maybe there is, but I don't know that we can listen to it. It's um, excerpted in a book of, and I'm sorry, I don't have the reference right in front of me, but I can follow up with Caitlin and send it. Um, but there's a book of um, sort of per, first person narratives of women who were in the internment camps and it's in, it's in that book. Okay, great. Yeah, and um, Sequoia, if you come up with that reference, let me know and I'll pass it on to Kiani. And then the next few questions are from Janet Koplos. Um, she asks, first of all, are Minnie's pieces all thick? Are they heavy? Um, and then there's some follow-up questions, but I'll let, let that one get answered first. Well, I'd say no. Actually, many of them are quite quite light. Like she made kind of quite a wide range. So she had the ashtrays, um, which are from, again, this line that she designed in the early 50s. Um, and then she continued to make more kind of pottery, like more like handmade pottery rather than a, a line or a design line. Um, and they tend to be on the lighter side, I would say. So they're not, they don't particularly go for that kind of uh, a real sort of hefty or chunky feel. And then uh, Janet followed up. Um, she was sorry that she came late and she might have missed some important things, um, but she was. Curious, Sequoia, when you speak of silence in regard to Minnie, have you acknowledged that she grew up in a traditional Japanese family? Um, being outspoken would have been exceedingly rare. 
also as a woman in the 50s, speaking out would have been unusual. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. That's a huge part of it. So I don't have a clear sense of how traditional her family was. I do know that both of her parents or if I'm remembering correctly, I, I could be wrong, but I do believe that both of her parents were, were born in Japan and emigrated to the U.S. and she was born in the U.S. So, you know, I don't know what exactly that tells us around how traditional her family was, um, but absolutely sort of the, the way, the options for, for women and women of Asian descent in the U.S. in the 1950s for sure were different than they were for folks in, in other circumstances, absolutely. Um, and I'd like to encourage anyone in the, in the audience with a question to unmute yourself and, and ask the question, or you can also still put it in the chat and I'll read it out loud for you. Maybe I'll add one other comment while we while we wait for someone to um, to see if there are questions, which is that um, one really interesting aspect of Menini's training was that while she was at Alfred as a student, um, Bernard Leach came through. So Bernard Leach is a widely known, um, kind of one of the founding figures of studio pottery, a British potter who was a real proselytizer for the idea of studio ceramics and saw himself really as the ambassador in the West of East Asian aesthetics. So Japanese, Korean, and Chinese. And he came on several lecture tours through the US and uh, was at Alfred for a couple of weeks in um, 1949, I believe, when Minnie was a student there. And there's these wonderful uh, documentary photos of Minnie and among kind of the group of students sort of surrounding Bernard Leach at the, um, in the Alfred uh, studios. And there's this, for me, a very interesting set of, I would say, speculations around the, uh, the possibility of receiving a piece of your identity um, as, a, as a woman of Asian descent from this very sort of Edwardian man who comes as the kind of bearer of Japanese ceramics and sort of I'm so fascinated and curious by how that like how that created um, a meaning for, for Mini Nagoro around her ideas of herself and her work and her heritage. Here's a picture of Greenwich House from the or what I was thinking that might be coming up because of the desks, yes? Yes, that would be uh, Greenwich House 1925. And you're right, that desk was whirled away. We dug it out from uh, one of the classrooms. There's a fireplace and it was under, you know, half an inch of dust. Half an inch isn't bad for 75 years. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question about, le to your point about legacy, like what happened to her objects? You know, there's a, uh, you said Daniel Rhodes had boxes and boxes of his papers. What happened to Minnie's archive? And do you have any advice for people who are makers or people who are collectors? So Minnie's archive um, is in various places now. So, and it also, you know, sort of the scope of archive too kind of varies. Quite a bit of the, the pottery or the ceramics that she had um, at the end of her life went to a, a family that she was very close with. And they're sort of the holders of the bulk of her, of the bulk of her pottery. Um, a good bit of it went to, um, or kind of a chunk of the, the archive is, is in the lovely and safe hands of Denise Pelletier, um, who has a, uh, you know, was again, the source of the molds. So she has a number of the molds and other kind of personal effects of minis. There's not a substantial paper archive at this point, or that I know of. Um, I haven't like exhaustively looked through every source. So there's a possibility that there's some at Alfred a little bit or some, I haven't, wasn't able to find any at the University of Connecticut at stores. Um, there are objects of minis in other institutional collections. So there's um, one at the Smithsonian, there's a few pieces around. So, and as we're seeing like, you know, as odd as it is, like first dibs is a little bit of an archive in its own way now, right? Like the fact that we can find objects, or even eBay, I suppose, the fact that we can find objects through this kind of filter is, is another aspect too. But to my understanding, there's not like a whole lot of, of papers of her. I would say the, the family that has a number of the objects of Minnie's, her ceramics, also has some, uh, uh, some of her papers and 
and personal effects as well. Okay, and we have a question from Magdalene for Kari. And Magdalene asks, Kari, can you talk more about building your work, talk more about building your work linked to other artists' work? I'm interested in the idea of bucking the idea of artist as a solitary genius. Is that something you're thinking about? <laughs> That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think, let's see, uh, in 2017, I, um, there's an, a conceptual artist from the 1970s named David Ireland, and he created um, a, in it, he turned his house into an artwork, essentially. And that house, when he passed away, lay dormant. And then um, in 2017, um, it was purchased and reopened. And a handful of artists, um, including myself, were asked to respond to this artwork with our own artwork. Um, that was the general premise. And we got to go into the house and read. Of course, I, I'm interested in archives. So I read through his papers and letters and um, ended up making a piece in response to him um, and his life. So that's how I started using that formula for my practice. And since then, the people that I've done projects on have, um, have kind of just come up through conversations and um, I, I tend to try to stick with the formula of having the people be related to site or ceramics in some way. So I've um, done projects on Julia Morgan, who was an architect in um, California who made the Hearst Castle, um, and as well as uh, Daniel Rhodes, obviously, and Menina Goro, um, and also a landscape painter named William Keith, who did a lot of paintings of California. And I think it's, it's exciting to be in conversation with these um with these artists they i'm realizing now that they have all passed away so it's a very uh one-sided conversation that i'm having with myself in my head um but uh but i think it's i think it, it again goes back to this idea of legacy what do you take how how do you learn from somebody and how do you have it influence your practice and what new ideas can you stay with it um, and further develop your work? So I don't think, I think all artists are influenced by many things. No one's in a silo by any means. So um, we're all learning from one another. And I, I like the idea of continuing that and um, yeah, and bringing in new resources and ideas and perspectives. And we've got the, the last question in the chat. Oh, Magdalene also says thanks. Um, so the last question of the night is from Yasuko, who asks, did Nagoro move from the mode of Minge to the mode of modern design? Or did you develop both modes simultaneously? That's a great question. So there's um, a wonderful piece of many Nagoros in the um, Everson Art Museum, uh, which is in Syracuse, New York, that was in their, one of their ceramic nationals. And the date, let me see if I can find it here, the date uh, is 1947. And so in 1947, she was working in kind of a Minge mode. And then in the early 1950s, as we saw with the ashtrays, she was working in a more kind of modern design mode. And then into the 60s and 70s and beyond, she was working somewhere in between in this kind of hybrid zone. And I mean, she was making pottery. She was committed to making pottery. It had the kind of very clean lines of, um, well, of both Japanese ceramics and of modern design, um, which is interesting. So I would say in between. Um, I'll also say that we, I haven't quite figured, or we haven't quite figured out how her whole like kind of um, Yoko Ono, Charlie Lucas mode sort of fits in <laughs> with that matrix of, of good design in the game. Um, well, thank you. It is a little bit after six. So um, I'm going to say thank you for everyone for coming today to the artist talk. Thank you to Sequoia and Kari for a wonderful exhibition. And um, without any further ado, I hope everyone has a lovely Friday evening and a, a good weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gary. Bye. Bye, everyone.